And now, please welcome Director of IBM Research, Dario Gill. Good afternoon. This past June, a uh, few blocks from where I'm standing right now, IBM unveiled Project Debater, an AI system that is capable of engaging with humans in a live debate. It was widely reported at the time that the system really held its own against two Israeli debate champions. But for us, it really is not about winning or losing but really about the ability to create AI that can master the infinitely complex and rich world of human language. Unlike games, language can really tell us more about human thought and expression. And it's this world that is most interesting to us at IBM Research. We believe there is great potential in having artificial intelligence that can understand us. The more transparent, and explainable that we can make AI, the more we can trust it. And the more we can trust it, the more we can rely on it to help us make better decisions. There is hope behind the technology that you're going to see demonstrated today. Let me briefly put into perspective what you're about to see. At IBM Research, we have a long history of creating technology and capability that can amplify and complement human cognition providing more information and more context for us to help us make better decisions. And Project Debater is no exception. We envision a future of the technology well beyond the podium, helping people to reason, to build well-informed arguments, and to make better decisions. Today, it will take on a human debater who holds the record for the most competition victories. Since June, our team of scientists have been improving the core AI technology behind the system to prepare for this formidable challenge. Nothing that you're about to see is pre-recorded or pre-scripted, except the very first sentence that the system will use to greet the human debater. I should also point out the team of computer scientists that will be with us on stage, who were part of the team that created the system and who, who is here to keep an eye uh, behind the scenes of what is happening. Today's topic was chosen from a curated list. It's important to note that Project Debater has never been trained to know that Project Debater was never trained on this topic. You may hear Project Debater repeat itself unnecessarily or make mistakes. This is because it's an AI system, and AI systems are far from perfect. Before I turn it over to our host, I want to give a shout out to the debate club from the Dougherty Valley High School in San Ramon, as well as the team from the Bay Area Urban Debate League, who is headed to the national finals. <laughs> and one last reminder, please silence your phones, and please, no flash photography. Now, without further delay, let me introduce the host for the evening, four-time Emmy winner from Intelligence Square, John Donvan. Thank you. How are you? Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dario. Um, so this really is a nice intersection, uh, crisscrossing right at the word intelligence. Your project debater here is an experiment in artificial intelligence, and I host a debate program with intelligence in its name, Intelligence Squared US. And since 2006, we have put on, across the nation, close to 170 debates on a wide range of topics from uh, policy to foreign policy to politics to culture to sports to food to what we eat to our healthcare systems, basically everything under the sun. Our goal in doing this has always been to raise the level of public discourse. That was the vision of our founders, Robert Rosencrantz and Alexandra Monroe. They are here in the house this evening. I would love to give them a round of applause and recognition for this. Um, and we do this uh, not only by encouraging and insisting on civility, but also frankly, by making a contest out of the challenge of having to present an argument intelligently and also persuasively. Here's a quick look at what I'm talking about.
We really aim to raise the level of public discourse by taking on tough but also nuanced subjects in which there's valid arguments on both sides to bring people to the stage who argue with passion, truthfulness, with respect for one another. I've seen pictures of the brain scans of people with CTE, and it looks like someone drove a truck across their brain. We actually do agree on a lot of foundation within which we have civilized debate. We actually share, as a nation, a civic religion. You and your fellow debaters all heard things from your opponents that you respect and take seriously. Demonstrating that is the essence of what we want to do here, so the way that you conducted this honors us. That was unquestionably an applause line right there, so. <laughs> uh, and let me, let me just interject that uh, all of our programs turn into podcasts and, and also television programs that travel far and wide, but at the moment I'm thinking with the podcast in mind, there will be an audience uh, that will hear uh, this debate far and wide and forever. And for that reason, I want to encourage you to bring energy to the room uh, throughout the evening by, by, by applauding uh, when you hear points you like and when I introduce the debaters. You know, the, we think we might be making history today, so someday you can tell your grandchildren who's listening to this podcast, you, you hear that clapping? That, that was, those were my hands doing that. So uh, please feel free to applaud when you like a point. It's, at Intelligence Squared, we always say we, we like that kind of positive reinforcement. We're just against the booing and hissing part, so no booing and hissing. Um, if, you, if you don't like something that you hear, uh, you might want to just let loose with perhaps um, a sardonic chuckle or something at, at most like that. But let's keep it positive, but let's really keep it uh, energetic. In fact, we have uh, already once debated the issue of artificial intelligence itself. Uh, that resolution was, don't trust the promise of artificial intelligence. Ooh, I felt a little pulse of resentment from behind me. <laughs> Did you feel, feel that? Um, we're going to be doing it again this spring around the matter of self-driving cars. But this, this, truly, this truly is a first for us, the first time that an artificial intelligence, namely Project Debater, will be on our stage arguing with a human being and may the best debater win. And as we like to say at every debate, may civil discourse win as well. So let's get started. Let's first uh, meet and applaud our debaters. First, arguing for the resolution tonight will be IBM Project Debater. And arguing against representing the rest of us, please welcome to the stage Harish Natarajan. He is a graduate of the University of Oxford and the University of Cambridge and a grand finalist at the 2016 World Debating Championships, also the 2012 European Debating Champion. Please come to the stage, Harish. Congratulations. Thank you. So we are going to be hosting a single debate this evening around a single resolution. The format's going to go like this. We go in three rounds. Uh, first, we will have uh, each participant offering a four-minute introductory argument on the topic. After that, we go to a second round. That's a four-minute rebuttal round. Each debater rebuts the arguments made. Finally, we move on to round three, and that's a closing round in which they make a two-minute closing statement, uh, sort of a summary. Uh, now we need you not only to applaud and keep the energy up, but to participate as the judges of this debate, we are going to ask you to vote before and after the arguments using your mobile phone to tell us where you stand on this position and to tell us whether you were persuaded or not by one side or the other. Um, so you're going to be asked first your position on the resolution. After the debate, you'll be asked if your position changed. We're also going to put a second question in there. We just want to know, in general, uh, who you feel better enriched your knowledge of this topic. Then we will share the results of the voting uh, after we have a panel discussion with uh, Harish and two of the IBM scientists who are behind this fascinating research. They're going to explain in even more detail what we just saw happen and how it happened. So to reveal now, the resolution of the evening is this. We should subsidize preschool. We should subsidize preschool. That's going to be the resolution, and I just want to say, in terms of, of what we uh, mean by that, the way that we're framing it, we are not talking about preschool in any particular locale, no particular city or state. We are also 
uh, not referring to any particular program that exists or any particular proposal out there. And finally, we are not talking about uh, targeting uh, or cho choosing preschool programs for any particular group of students in any particular place. So, knowing, knowing now that that is our resolution, we should subsidize preschool, I want to ask you please to take out your smartphones and type in the URL shown on the screen. It's also listed in your program and you can begin to vote. And we're going to give you a couple of minutes to do that. Uh, we're going to lock it out in probably about two minutes, which I think a crowd like this will be able to handle that. So let's get started. I'm going to go to my lectern. And our first debater in round one uh, will be Project Debater. A four-minute introduction from Project Debater. Again, and, 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 and Project Debater uh, actually has a gender. She uh, will be arguing. <laughs> she will be arguing for the resolution, we should subsidize preschool. Ladies and gentlemen, here we go, Project Debater. Greetings, Harish. I have heard you hold the world record in debate competition wins against humans, but I suspect you've never debated a machine. Welcome to the future. I will argue that we should subsidize preschools. We are going to talk about financial issues, but not only about them. In the current status quo, we accept that the question of subsidies goes beyond money and touches on social, political, and moral issues. When we subsidize preschools and the like, we are making good use of government money because they carry benefits for society as a whole. It is our duty to support them. Subsidies are an important policy instrument. They provide governments with the means through which to pursue industrial development and ensure the livelihoods of their citizens. There are two issues I will elaborate on now. I will start by explaining why preschool is an important investment. I will also say a few words about poverty, and I will end by discussing some other issues that show the positive aspects of preschools. Regarding investment, nature-based preschools are powerful interpretive programs as well as lucrative business decisions. As I mentioned, preschool is an important investment. For decades, research has demonstrated that high-quality preschool is one of the best investments of public dollars, resulting in children who fare better on tests and have more successful lives than those without the same access. Secondly, a few words about poverty. While I cannot experience poverty directly and have no complaints concerning my own standards of living, I still have the following to share. Regarding poverty, research clearly shows that a good preschool can help kids overcome the disadvantages often associated with poverty. The OECD has recommended that governments subsidize pre-primary education to boost performance in poor areas. A statistical summary of studies from 1960 and 2013 by the National Institute for Early Education Research found that high-quality preschool can create long-term academic and social benefits for individuals and society, far exceeding costs. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reports that universal full-day preschool creates significant economic savings in health care, as well as decreased crime, welfare dependence and child abuse. Former Prime Minister Gough Whitlam said in 1973 that preschool is the greatest single aid in removing or modifying the inequalities of background, environment, family income or family nationality. Now to an additional, final issue. A study by the Melbourne Institute of Applied Economic and Social Research shows that attendance at preschool has a significant positive impact on later Naplin outcomes, particularly in the domains of numeracy, reading and spelling. The results of a new study of over 1,000 identical and fraternal twins, published in Psychological Science, a journal of the Association for Psychological Science, confirm that preschool programs are a good idea. Here is a study from New Jersey that is worth noting. In New Jersey, the follow-up to the Abbott Preschool Program study continues to find that high-quality preschool programs increase achievement in language arts and literacy, math, and science through fourth and fifth grade. I hope I relayed the message that we should subsidize preschools. You will possibly hear my opponent talk today about different priorities and subsidies. He might say that subsidies are needed, but not for preschools. I would like to ask you, Mr. Natarajan, if you agree in principle, why don't we examine the evidence and the data and decide accordingly? Thank you for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, Project Debater.
And I want to point this out. Both debaters were given 15 minutes to prepare for this debate. In other words, <laughs> Harish, it was only 15 minutes ago that you were told the topic of this debate. So that's one of the, that's your kind of wizardry as well, and you're very good at it. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our uh, debater arguing against the resolution we should subsidize preschool, Harish Natarajan. Well, thank you very much, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here for this historic event. And it certainly was a pleasure to listen to Project Debater. There was a lot of information in that speech and lots of facts and lots of figures. The problem, though, is the reality of subsidizing preschools is one which does not deal with the underlying problems in society. It is one which often makes those worse and in the end is very little more than a politically motivated giveaway to members of the middle class. Let me start by examining the main claim from Project Debater. I think Project Debater suggests something very intuitive, that if we believe preschools are good in principle, surely it is worth giving money to subsidize those. But I don't think that is ever enough of a justification for subsidies. Why is that the case? because there are multiple things which are good for society. That could be in countries like the United States, increased investment in healthcare, which would often also have returns for education, which the OECD would also note is probably very beneficial to deal with poverty. It would be improving tertiary education to allow people more access to social mobility, or given the reality of underfunded schools trying to improve secondary education. My point here is not that all of those things are necessarily better than preschools, but simply that it cannot be alone a sufficient argument for Project Debater to claim that there are some benefits. The question is more subtle than that. What is the question then? I think the criterion of whether or not we should then distribute subsidies should be asked on two, uh, based on two claims. The first is, is this underprovided and underconsumed in the status quo? I'll talk more about that in a moment. And second, does it actually help those individuals who are the most harmed by society? Why exactly doesn't preschool or subsidization of preschool do that? I want to make two claims under this. The first is, Many middle-class parents and many people from upper incomes already send their children to preschool. This is because they value many of the things which Project Debater noted. But why is that a problem? Because subsidization costs an awful lot of money, and that is money which is giving people, particularly members of the middle class and above, money to do things which they would do otherwise. Why is that so damaging? Given the realities of opportunity costs here, the problem is that you are, giving you are taking money from all taxpayers to help those individuals within a society who are already often the best off. And I don't think that is principally justified as a way of the state distributing its resources. But the second thing I want to claim is that even when you substitute, even when you subsidize preschools, it doesn't mean that all individuals go. And this, I think, was the fallacy from what we heard from Project Debater. Yes, you could make it slightly more accessible for individuals to attend preschool. That doesn't mean those individuals who are as poor as Project Debater seems to, want to, seems to care about people are going to be those who have the ability to send their child to preschool. There'll still be individuals who'll be priced out because of the realities of the market. And these individuals now face not just one exclusion, but a double exclusion. Their tax money, money which could be used to otherwise help them and their children in myriad other ways, is no, longer being, is no longer going to them, and they are not able to gain from the benefits of it. In the end, when it comes to the question of subsidization, there is always going to be trade-offs, and that needs to be accepted. Given the reality of those trade-offs, the question is, who do you help? And the people you don't help are those individuals who are the poorest. You give unfair and ex exaggerated gains to those individuals in the middle class. And that is why, at the end of this debate, we don't think that you should subsidize preschools. Thank you, Harish Natarajan. So we, before we move on to the rebuttal round, I just want to summarize some of what we've heard. We have heard Project Debater make the argument in support of the resolution we should subsidize preschools. 
by saying that this is not just a matter of finance, but it's also a moral and political issue. It, has a, it relates to a duty to support some of the most vulnerable people in society, that preschool itself, uh, subsidized or not, has a broader impact on the lives of individual citizens. She cited uh, research that says that uh, investment in preschool results uh, without doubt in uh, maximally successful lives. It increases income, uh, and it also helps to overcome several of the disadvantages of poverty. Uh, again, it, uh, there's better health outcomes. There are actually decreases in crime. And she cites a, a number of studies to, uh, to back this up. Um, basically, also, she anticipated her opponent probably making the argument that um, subsidies would serve one group at the expense of another. She also threw in a few jokes along the way and was um, surprisingly uh, charming and human sounding, I would say. Mm -hmm. But also uh, charming and human sounding was the human on the stage. <laughs> uh, Harish Natarajan, he argued against the resolution that we should subsidize preschools. He said that basically uh, Project Debater's argument does not deal really in uh, addressing the underlying problems that she was arguing that preschool claims to solve, that uh, too often uh, preschool functions as a politically, uh, subsidies for preschool function as a politically motivated giveaway to the middle class, that there are other programs out there that deserve support. It does not mean that preschool does not, but the idea of putting preschool ahead of the line for uh, government resources and uh, taxpayer uh, dollars is a questionable act. In fact, speaking of question, he said the whole question is much more subtle uh, than Project Debater was stating. He questions whether, uh, in fact, preschool might actually uh, help those who it is most trying to, might actually harm those it is most trying to hurt. Middle class families already are taking advantage of preschool. They're paying it for it for themselves, so they would be paying for it or rather already, but now uh, they would be, uh, these families would be gaining subsidies uh, to do things that they would be doing otherwise, and this uh, obviously is, uh, diminishes resources available to everyone. So um, those are roughly the arguments. We're going to uh, give each of the debaters a few more minutes to prepare uh, for their rebuttal round. But uh, before we do, I just wanted to bring to the stage um, one of the designers of, uh, of, of Project Debater, Noam Slonim, who is um, um, out of, well, you're, you're out of Tel Aviv, not Haifa, Israel, but welcome to the stage. I, I just wanted to take one minute, since we're in this phase where over there and here, there's a process going on through an artificial intelligence trying to figure out what to say next. What does that involve? So I, I will try to explain briefly what is happening under the hood. So thank you, John. As uh, you stated, we just heard two interesting opening speeches by uh, Project Debater and Harish. And Project Debater, as we speak, is now trying to uh, prepare the rebuttal speech. And as we know, in a debate, the rebuttal is the most uh, challenging part. So the system is starting by using Watson's speech recognition capabilities in order to understand the words that Harish was using. And then he tries to segment these words into meaningful sentences. And the next step is really to capture the gist of the speech by Harish. Okay? So the system is basically using a collection of artificial intelligence engines in order to, first of all, somehow anticipate what Harish will state and then determine whether indeed he was stating these arguments explicitly or implicitly in and, his and speech, it, and then generate some kind of a meaningful rebuttal to that. It sounds like an amazing challenge, and you'll be b back after the third round to, with uh, your colleagues to discuss this in more detail, but I just wanted to get a look ahead, so thanks very much for Thank joining you, us. No, Thank, Thank you, John. Thank you. So now we move on to round two rebuttals. And again, each side will have four minutes to respond to the opponent's arguments. First, with her rebuttal, Project Debater arguing for the resolution, we should subsidize preschool. Thank you again. For starters, I sometimes listen to opponents and wonder, what do they want? Would they prefer poor people on their doorsteps begging for money? Would they live well with poor people without heating and running water? Giving opportunities to the less fortunate should be a moral obligation of any human being, and it is a key role for the state. To be clear, we should find the funding for preschools and not rely on luck or market forces. 
This issue is too important to not have a safety net. Next, I think that Harish Natarajan raised the following issue. There are more important things than preschools to spend money on. The state budget is a big one, and there is room in it to subsidize preschools and invest in other fields. Therefore, the idea that there are more important things to spend on is irrelevant because the different subsidies are not mutually exclusive. I believe the following example from a related field will explain what I am trying to say about subsidy policies. Research shows that child care subsidies to low-income parents enable those parents to enter and remain in the workforce. To be clear, my intention is not to leave a suitcase full of money for everyone to grab at will. We are talking about a limited, targeted, and helpful mechanism, as in this example. Next, I will discuss three issues which explain why we should subsidize preschools. I will demonstrate that preschool education improves children's development. I will also discuss issues related to the claim that attending preschool helps students succeed. And finally, I will raise points associated with how preschool can prevent future crime. About children. Preschool is a very important and an essential step in a child's life. Research indicates that access to quality preschool can provide a boost for children that will influence their success for the rest of their lives. Senior leaders at St. Joseph's R.C. Primary School say that nursery will help give children the best start to their education. There is clear evidence that high-quality nurseries led by graduate nursery teachers are among the most decisive ways to prevent children, particularly poor boys, from falling behind. Next, students. A quality preschool education is essential for laying the foundations for successful learning, including transition to full-time school and future school success. In December 2015, researchers at Duke University concluded that investing in preschool helps both students and educators long-term. They found that students who enroll in preschool education are 39% less likely to be placed in special education programs as third graders. Of the 1,010 registered voters surveyed, 61% consider a high-quality preschool experience very important to a student's later success, and 22% said it is somewhat important. Lastly, crime. Preschool is an effective tool for keeping kids in school and out of jail, while reducing the amount of crime in our neighborhoods. It is an effective crime prevention strategy. A substantial body of research shows that high-quality preschool education is key in preparing children to succeed in school and career training, and helps reduce the enormous financial costs of remedial work, delinquency and crime. Studies have shown that quality preschool leads to better academic performance throughout life, higher earning and less criminal activity. They show that high-quality preschool boosts high school graduation rates, and children who do not attend high-quality preschool are far more likely to commit violent crimes. To recap this rebuttal speech, I argue that preschool education improves children's development, that attending preschool helps students succeed, and lastly, that preschool can prevent future crime. Let me wrap up this speech in a way that I hope you can relate to. Advocating welfare is like offering a hand to someone who fell. It's basic human decency. Therefore, I think the motion should stand. We should subsidize preschools. That concludes my speech. Thanks for listening. And now the round two rebuttal from Harish Natarajan, who is arguing, again, against the resolution we should subsidize preschool. So I want to start by noting what Project Debater and I agree on. We agree that poverty is terrible. It is terrible when individuals do not have running water. It is terrible when they struggle to meet ends meet, to make ends meet, and they are struggling to feed their family. It is terrible when they cannot get health care to cover their child to even provide them the basics they need in life. That is all terrible. And those are all things we need to address. And none of those are addressed just because you are going to subsidize preschool. Why is that the case? Project Debater raises an interesting claim when she notes that maybe the state has the budget to do all the good things. Maybe the state has the budget to provide health care. Maybe it has the budget to provide welfare payments. Maybe it has the budget to provide running water as well as preschool. I would love to live in that world, but I don't think that is the world we live in. I think we live in a world where there are real constraints on what governments can spend money on. 
And even if those are not real, those are nonetheless political, where you have people constantly talking about the size of government debt and deficits and who will be opposed to spending more and more money. Why does that matter? Because in the real world, both in terms of the practicalities of the amount of different good programs we have and would like to spend money on, and in the real world, where on a political level, you cannot always spend more and more money just because something is good, we do need to make choices. And why then is preschool the bad choice to start spending money on? Now, Project Debater had a lot of evidence all of which was saying that preschool leads to other good outcomes. Now, I would first want to note is I don't think that's comparative with the other potential projects we could put in place. But let's ignore that argument for a moment. Why else do I not think those arguments were particularly convincing? I don't think it's particularly convincing because I'm not sure that subsidies even help those individuals that Project Debater thinks that we should be helping. Note, time and time again, Project Debater said, high quality preschools can lead to huge improvements on individuals' lives. Maybe, but I'm not sure if you massively increase the number of people going to preschool, they are all gonna be the ones going to the high quality preschools. I don't think that just because you subsidize it, those individuals who are the poorest are those individuals who are going to be able to, whose parents are still gonna be able to spend the money and the time necessary to give their child a chance at preschool. Project Debater notes that maybe high quality preschools will reduce crime, maybe, but so would other measures in terms of crime prevention. So would, for, and, and that again presupposes that these are high quality and the subsidy alone allows people to go. And this is the core point I want to make. Bearing in mind that this does create, it is a huge subsidy for the middle class, that realistic budget constraints we have means the money can be spent better elsewhere. But the final thing I want to note is maybe you believe all of this empirical evidence about the value of preschool. I would note that that is probably at least somewhat flawed because what it actually picks up is that it's those individuals who are middle class who often send their children to preschool right now and they have plenty of advantages, so I'm not even sure preschool's the decisive one. But here's a reason why for many students it may not even be good, that from an early age, either that preschool doesn't teach a child anything or is pushing that child to learn. In a competitive environment at the age of three or four, when you're learning that, you are, you're, that that other child is potentially better than you, when you realize you aren't necessarily as talented as someone else, that huge psychological damage for many children may not even, may mean that preschool is actively harmful. At the end, even if you believe that preschool is good, it isn't the way and where we should spend the money, particularly given that it's a subsidy to the middle class, I'm very happy to oppose. Thank you, Harish. So we are about to move on to uh, the closing round. Those will be two-minute closing statements by each of the two debaters. But before they do, and, and in order to give them a few moments to prepare, I just want to return briefly to the subject of uh, something close to my heart, and that's the mission of Intelligence Squared US. Um, I've moderated of our 170 debates, um, all but 22 of them. And um, I've, I'm a journalist by profession, um, but we live in a time when journalism is under challenge and also when um, the discourse uh, uh, among citizens is um, not at its best, let's say. And what we, the, the reason I'm, I'm so pleased to be part of Intelligence Squared is what its mission embraces is the notion that argument is not a bad thing. Argument is a good thing when argument is done well. And by done well, what we mean is to do it in a setting that is respectful, uh, that is respectful of individuals, uh, respectful of the idea that there may well be a good, a good argument on the other side that needs to be listened to, um, respectful of things like facts and logic and reason and science. Um, it really is our mission to bring this to the forefront. And we've, we have uh, held de debates in, um, in this community in the past. We've done them in New York, in Los Angeles, and uh, um, Chicago, and in Brussels, and in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and what, what is astounding is that we, we find ourselves going into places where we may encounter people sitting in our audience who 
without even really wanting to, realize in the course of a debate that they are, they are in a bubble, that they have never really heard an argument put by the other side before in such a way that um, they, they take it in and they weigh it and they, they consider it and they judge it sometimes more favorably than they might have thought of otherwise. Because here's the secret thing about a debate. By its nature, you're going to hear two arguments. You're going to hear opposing arguments and you're going to hear them put forward in a respectful way. And that's the thing that we're doing. And um, at the end of every debate, I go out into the lobby and kind of hang out with the people who have just left the debate. And we have a lot of people come to all of our debates, but we also have, at most cases, a lot of newcomers, particularly for some reason in Manhattan. It's kind of a date. It's kind of a date night. Um, <laughs> maybe people want to sort of show off uh, their intellect by bringing a date to a debate. Um, but what I find happens is that it works. Um, uh, the, the, the energy in the lobby when people spill out is just so amazing. They're just buzzing and they're debating with each other and they're excited and they're, they're really lit up by it, by this experience. And sometimes I think the experience that they've had is that they actually changed their minds and didn't expect to. And maybe there's something sort of liberating about that experience, particularly in the time that we're living in. So um, I, I just want to say that uh, if, you, if you have the chance to uh, follow us uh, through any, any of the channels in which we're putting, uh, putting our, our story and our debates out there, please do so. And we do keep it civil, there, almost always. There was, okay, there was one time, it was a debate, of course, about Israel, and things got heated, and there were two debaters who were this set to each other, and that was the one time that I, I stood up and I walked to the head of the stage and I raised my arms, in my mind a little bit like Moses parting the Red Sea, and, and I asked them, come on, pull it back, and they did, and then they went on to have a, a really good evening. But they're very exciting and they're very thrilling, and I think when Dario Gill got up here and said that what they're thinking of in terms of um, uh, artificial intelligence that debates is to help us think better, and to help us with critical reasoning, we get that, because we're in, in the same mission, essentially. So, I hope that didn't sound like a commercial, because I actually believe in it, it's really our passion, and we're delighted to be here. But it's time to move on to round three, and round three are closing statements by each debater in turn, and they will begin, once again, closing in support of the, art, of the resolution we should subsidize preschool. Here again is Project Debater. Thanks for this final opportunity to speak out in this debate, and thanks, Harish Natarajan. One might say that this conversation can serve no purpose anymore, but I feel differently. Allow me to start with a brief rebuttal. Among other things, I think Mr. Natarajan suggested that preschools should not be subsidized because this will reduce their quality. I would like to offer a different view. I disagree with my opponent. Subsidizing preschools will have no negative effect on their quality. If anything, the opposite is true. One of many reasons is that subsidizing attracts more skilled and qualified people to the field, improving the quality of preschools for all. Here is a final summary of my arguments today. My opponent claimed that preschools are harmful. I believe my argument suggested that the benefits outweigh the potential disadvantages. I touched upon three issues, children, students, and crime. Specifically, I noted that preschool education improves children's development. In addition, I suggested that attending preschool helps students succeed. And a final point to consider is that preschool can prevent future crime. When this debate just started, I said that we will talk about financial issues. We did, and I am convinced that in my speeches I supplied enough data to justify support for preschools. At the end of the day, the benefits welfare provides outweigh the disadvantages. Welfare helps the most important segments in society, the underprivileged, the weak, the children. If we want to have a better society, then we must invest in those who are less fortunate. Finally, in the words of British politician and writer Benjamin Disraeli, power has only one duty, to secure the social welfare of the people. We should subsidize preschools. Thanks for your attention. And the last word going to Harish, uh, arguing in his closing statement against the resolution. So I think we disagree on far less than it may seem. 
because we agree that the people we should care about are the underprivileged, the children, those individuals who are weak. That is what Project Debater said herself. But the problem is not that preschool is necessarily harmful. I concede in the vast majority of cases, it is much better for an individual to go to preschool than not. But it is the reality that what this policy is, is a huge, huge subsidy, primarily to the middle class and not to those individuals who are the most vulnerable, who are the most underprivileged and the most disadvantaged. Why is that the case? It is first the case because what we said from the start is you cannot fund everything. I think this is simply empirically true and you have to make choices and you have to make trade-offs. The problem with preschool in that context is twofold. The first is that a lot of that money goes to individuals who would have sent their child to preschool anyway, those individuals from the middle class. All of those benefits exist on either side of the world. But for those individuals who are more vulnerable, this is first billions and billions of dollars, which is probably not going to them and largely going to individuals in the middle class. And that's where the trade-off for better health, that where it's the trade-off for individuals to have running water, one of the problems Project Debater identified with people who are poor. But that is a real trade-off for those people. But second, often those are the parents who still, even when there are subsidies, will struggle to send their child to good quality preschools. They str struggle to send their child to good quality preschools because they don't even have the money for what is left. They'll struggle to send their child to preschools if they don't value the amount of effort and time they have to put into it. They'll struggle to send their children to preschools, or when they do, it probably will be the whiz preschools which exist. And yes, quality across the board may not fall, but in some cases it will, and those poor individuals will probably be stuck in those. At the end of this debate, I don't think the project debater has helped those individuals she identifies as the most important, but in reality has hurt them. Thank you, and that concludes round three and the argument phase of this debate. So um, we're on our way to making history here. Um, we would like to ask you now to complete that process by using your phones again. Uh, those of you who are not live tweeting every moment, take out your phone and choose your position where you stand now that you've heard the arguments from both sides. Um, and please pay attention to the second question. Um, who better enriched your knowledge of this topic? And while we are getting the vote going, I think we'd like to have a little chat. So I want to, uh, and Harish, I'd like you to join us. So we're going we're gonna to move the furniture a little bit, and uh, we're going to invite to the stage in, uh, I think right now, in fact, here comes the furniture. Um, I want to invite to the stage two of the, uh, two of the scientists who have been working for literally years uh, at creating the artificial intelligence that you just saw. So why don't you come up to the stage? You've already met. Congratulations. Very nicely done. Thank you. You have already met uh, Noam Slonim, and um, Noam is the principal investigator of Project Debater, and also Ranit Akhronov, the worldwide manager. Harsh, you know, but I haven't officially shaking your hand on the stage, <laughs> so let's do that. So, um, I, the, the first person I want to go to actually on this is Harish, this mm -hmm. experience of um, fighting with this thing. <laughs> <laughs> Rhetorically. Well, <laughs> well, what really struck me is the potential value for Project Debater when synthesized with a human being, and that the amount of knowledge which it's able to grasp and more than that, obviously, you can get some knowledge just by searching for it, but able to contextualize it and place it as this information tells us this, which I found to be really useful. So all the studies from the OECD, from those countries, some of those quotations, were all just really interesting to me because it was nicely phrased and it was contextualized as to what the purpose of it is. And I think if you take some of those skills and you add to that to a human being which can use it in slightly more subtle ways, I think that can be incredibly powerful. I think that's what I got from it, which is it was fascinating to listen to, 
because I can see a lot of the potential it has just in terms of the knowledge uh -huh. and the ability to contextualize that knowledge better than most human beings You can. are a very good sport. <laughs> <laughs> Noam, Noam w w the, uh, it was apparent, I think, throughout that, um, that the two debaters had different skills and, and different talents and different advantages. On, on the advantage side, what does debater have going for her that, that Harish could not possibly meet? match? So they have uh, very different styles, I mm -hmm. believe, and, and a different set of skills. But I would like to start by, again, telling Harish is really a superb debater. Yeah. It was really amazing to hear you speak uh, today. And, uh, and what is interesting to see is that uh, I think in terms of rhetorical skills, the system is still not at the level of uh, a debater like Harish. That said, the system is capable of pinpointing uh, relevant evidence within a massive collection of... Uh, How massive? Of so about uh, 10 billion sentences that are in the memory of the system. And the system needs to very quickly pinpoint these little pieces of text that are uh, relevant to the topic, uh, argumentative in nature, and hopefully support our side of the debate, mm -hmm. and then somehow glue them together into a meaningful narrative, which is very, very difficult for a, for a machine to do. And, and Renit, you and I were talking earlier, and, and you, you were arguing, interesting word, <laughs> you, you were arguing, you were making the point that um, while this is an interesting exercise, win or lose in the audience, by the way, you have one more minute to finish voting on who wins or loses, but that, you're, you see the, the, the good that this thing offers, not, not being to win a game, mm -hmm. but to help us figure things out. What do you mean by that? What I mean is that the vision behind Project Debater is how do we develop a technology, and I think Harish talked to that, the potential of AI and humans doing something together that brings the skills of both of them into something that's more than one of them. I think it's not a question of, is AI going to be better at debating than humans? That's not really an interesting goal. The goal of this demonstration, the goal of developing this technology, was to set something that's challenging and far away, and by that, enable us to develop technologies of how do you find all that information within a massive text? How do you organize that? How do you bring it to a position that it's digestible by humans in order to drive better decision making more quickly for humans. So really, I think what's going for us going to be a win here is that people come out of this room and say, wow, I can see that this interaction is enriching me and enriching the way I can make decisions in the future. I mentioned before that in Intelligence Squared, we, we, we've set things up so that by its nature, a debate presents an audience with at least two points of view on something. And, and while the audience votes and we declare a winner, the reality is that um, we, there, are two there are two teams debating because there actually are two valid, coherent arguments from, right. from each side. And it, it's not a zero-sum thing. They, it's more that they complement and they add to, to one another. Does that thought relate also to your vision for, the, for a debater? Yeah, I think if you think about um, grand challenges in the past in AI, these were often cases where there is a, either a factual question, there's a right or wrong, there's a clear winner. When you think of debate, this is something where the winner is not clear, and the whole question does have two points. There isn't one right answer. Mm -hmm. and, and technology like Project Debater, it could debate both sides, so it can very quickly help you understand both sides of a problem, bring you all the pros and cons, so you have a better, a wider view of the topic, and then can make a better decision. Noam, let's, let's, and also just for the sake of transparency, but also I think it sheds light on the capacity, let's talk about the way in which this debate was framed in a way to, to give debater a shot at this. So mm -hmm. a, as an example, um, in an Intelligence Squared debate, we do a round that goes on for quite some time where I ask challenging questions um, and um, I try to bring, the de de point, bring out points of contention. Well, we didn't do that round. Mm -hmm. could, could debater have survive something like that at this point? Not, not at this stage, mm -hmm. but I think uh, 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 in principle, these are capabilities that, uh, that we can develop. But we needed somehow to frame the challenge 
when, when we started to walk and when we started to make progress, because it, it is worthwhile noting why this is so difficult. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and let me give you just one example. We were sitting here for uh, 20 to 25 minutes and uh, we listened to a valuable and interesting discussion between man and machine, which is uh, not an ordinary experience. And the system was very consistent, arguing in favor of its own side. And to us, this may seem very natural, but actually for a machine to automatically understand that these particular arguments are supporting the topic right. and not contesting the topic is very, very difficult. And the fact that the system was consistent in its arguments for the entire debate means that in this subtle question, the system was able to achieve uh, close to 100% accuracy. So we needed to frame the problem and focus on the things that we can achieve in a few years. What you are referring to is perhaps the next stage so, of the but, system. But as you point out, what it did tonight, and, and by, by knowing what its side was, and then recognizing among its billions of pieces of emphasis, of billion sentences, what, like, what uh, selections would support the side that it was on, can you explain in 30 seconds or less how that works? <laughs> I still have 30 seconds. <laughs> well, no, you just used up six okay. of it. So, so uh, uh, the system is starting by using this uh, huge collection of sentences to find these little pieces of text and then glue them together in a meaningful manner. This is one part of the story. The other part is the system using a unique a collection of uh, more principled arguments that are relevant to the topic. We heard some of them during the debate, touching on the core issue of welfare state and when it is justified to use a subsidy or not. And finally, there is the listening comprehension, comprehension part. So the system was listening to Harish speaking for four minutes, raising quite uh, subtle and, and nuanced arguments and was still trying to get the gist of that and make a meaningful response. I think most of the time the response was fair, not always, but this is expected in AI. So this is how it works. All right, I think we may have the results. Am I, am I correct? I'm, all right, moment of truth. Well, it's all truth. I mean, we <laughs> made that argument, but you, you know what I mean. Thank you very much. I, you know, uh, you haven't had a round of applause, but it looks like you've been working hard. Thanks. I'm going to return to my lectern for this function. <laughs> OK. So to remind you one more time, you voted before you heard the arguments. You voted after you heard the arguments. And at Intelligence Squared, we deliver victory to the team who's, to the side whose numbers have moved up the most in percentage point terms. So let's look at how this vote went. went. On the resolution, subsidized preschool before the debate, in polling this live audience here in San Francisco, 79% of you agreed with the resolution, 13% disagreed, 8% were undecided. Mm -hmm. On the second vote, the team uh, debater who was arguing for the resolution, its first vote was 79%, its second vote was 62%. That means it lost 17 percentage points. On the other side, Harish Natarajan, his first vote was 13%, his second vote was 30%. He pulled up 17 percentage points. That is it. Harish Natarajan, arguing against the resolution, subsidized preschool, declared our winner. Our congratulations to them. Our congratulations to him. But, but, but really, we talked about this before. Um, this, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. And I think, regardless, we made history tonight because... Um, Project Debater held her own and um, won your respect, Harish. Yep. Oh, definitely. And so I just want to—I want to thank everybody for what you just for, for being here. And um, oh, and we had the second vote. Um, the question was, um, which of the two debaters better enriched your knowledge? Let's see what that number is. Project Debater. Uh, better enriched the knowledge of the audience on that side. So a little bit of a split decision. So thank you, everybody. You can exit the stage. And I'm going to exit the stage as well. It's been a pleasure for us to be part of this at Intelligence Squared US. And I want to thank Dario to come back up to the stage. Oh, OK. Ah, we're staying here.
Let's go. First of all, let's, let's have a, a round of a. Oh, sorry. I think we have a uh, music. <laughs> so let's have a round of applause first for John, Harish, and uh, Project Debater. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge you know, the team that was on stage. A lot of the team that was behind building it is also with us in the back. So <laughs> congratulations. I really hope uh, that what you witness here tonight, which you know, such an incredible, incredible moment for the field of AI, uh, has given all of you some food for thought. As I mentioned in uh, my opening remarks, in really, it's not about winning or losing. A specific debate, but, and I think the point was made really well during the night, about the opportunity to build complementary technology that help us reason better and bring evidence better so that in the end, this technology is for us, for humans, so that we can make better decisions and solve problems. You'll have an opportunity for all of you who are attending Think to continue to engage with the technology. We've created a technology called Speech by Crowd, uh, enabled by project debater capabilities, that is going to allow you to contribute arguments around a topic. Uh, we're going to be debating flu vaccination should be mandatory. So each of you can contribute arguments in favor or against. And what Speech by Crowd will do is we'll be able to take those arguments and construct narratives about the best arguments in favor and against that all of you have submitted. So I think that that's really, really exciting that you'll get to do, because we'll get to tap into an infinite source of data, which is human opinion. I want to thank uh, John, Harish, and as well as our researchers, again, who have built it. We really think this is such an exciting time for AI. And I hope that you'll continue to engage with us in the months and year, years ahead to bring this technology you know, to the success of both business and society. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.